This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. All right, I want to talk through uh, chapter two. And this chapter, there are no calculations in here. It's all uh, written, and I'm not going to read every word of the uh, notes to you. You must read it yourself. Uh, but in some ways, it's very much background, although every single thing in this chapter has been tested at some stage in the exam. Um, and I wasn't quite sure where to put the chapter. I'm putting it now as background. You know, for instance, as you'll see, you need to um, be basically aware how the stock exchange works, because later we do a lot of work on um, shares and share prices. So you need to be aware how the financial system works. Um, not to any great detail, but um, a lot of this we talk about in more detail in later chapters. So I'm going to chat through the important bits now, but I do suggest when you've been through all the other chapters and looked at things like share prices, you have another quick look at this chapter uh, and check it does make sense. So several uh, separate things interrelated, but uh, first of all, Make sure you're clear what we mean by financial intermediation. What it is, is we've got lots of people, companies, individuals, want to borrow money. And we've got lots of individuals or companies want to deposit money. Well, if I uh, want to deposit money and earn interest, and if you want to borrow money and pay interest, I could lend directly to you. But of course, we tend not to. Rather than um, borrow and lend directly between two companies, uh, we tend to do it via a bank. Now, there are other examples later, but a bank is therefore what we call an intermediary. They're taking money from people who want to deposit, but they're then lending that money to people who want to borrow. We do it through the bank rather than I borrow direct to you. Now, I can uh, lend direct to you. That's something we'll mention later in one of the later chapters. But most times it's done via the bank. The bank's an intermediary. Uh, and now again, this has been tested. Be aware of what the benefit of using the bank as an intermediary is. And it's those three things, and learn the words, but be clear what they mean. First of all, aggregation. What this means, think about it, you've got lots of individuals who want to deposit money with the bank, uh, but for relatively low sums. You know, each individual might deposit a few hundred or a few thousand with the bank. On the other hand, you've got companies who want to borrow large amounts. They want to borrow a hundred thousand, but you know, most individuals only have small amounts to deposit, to lend. So what does the bank do? They've got lots of people depositing relatively small amounts. 1,000 from me, 500 from you, and so on. But as a result, they've got lots of money deposited. They can then lend big amounts. They're aggregating, they're totaling. Uh, that's one reason we do it via a bank. I want to borrow 100,000. Who can I find who can lend me 100,000? I can't find anybody who can lend me that much. But there may be 100 people each prepared to deposit 1,000. They do it to the bank. The bank can then lend out big amounts. Uh, secondly, maturity transformation. Ooh. Get a little example with the bank. Maybe you've got lots of individuals want to deposit small amounts for relatively short periods. You know, I may have some a thousand spare cash at the moment. 
Oh, I'm happy to deposit with the bank for six months, a year. I don't want to deposit for too long, I might need it. Uh, companies, though, they tend to want to borrow money for longer periods. They might want to borrow money for 10 years. Well, I'm not prepared to lend them money for 10 years. You know, again, I don't know what's going to happen in 10 years. I, I'm only prepared to lend money for a year. Well, a function of the banks. They've got lots of people lending money for short periods. And it's continual. So I deposit for a year, take my money out. But then in a year's time, other people are depositing for a year and so on. So they've always got money coming in for short periods. What the bank can do is use the money that, that's in and lend it for long periods. That's what we call maturity transformation. Lots of people depositing just for a year, let's say. And it's continual. The bank's always got the money because as I take my money out, somebody else is putting their money in. Lots of people depositing for short periods. The bank because it keeps getting repeated, they can lend money for long periods. Uh, and finally, diversification of risk. Subject to the two things I've already said, uh, ignoring those two for the moment, if you're a company wants to borrow 100,000, then if I happen to have 100,000 I can afford to lend, I could lend it directly to you. But I am taking a risk, obviously, that um, if your company ends up collapsing, I lose my money. There is risk. But when I do it through a bank, I deposit my 100,000. The bank is lending my money to other people. But they're lending money to lots and lots of companies. And so even though some of those companies may go bankrupt, it's not going to hit me as it would if I'd lent directly. You know, I know we had the financial crash a while ago, but generally speaking, the bank's not going to go bankrupt. They're making sure they charge enough that if somebody doesn't repay the loan, the bank is still going to make money. And so, I'm losing the risk. We call it diversification. It's much less risky for me to lend the money to the bank and the bank lend it out than me lend it directly. So, that's the first thing I wanted to mention. That is important for the exam. Not for arithmetic. No arithmetic whatsoever. And there wouldn't really be much uh, on it in the exam, but there's going to be one or two two-mark questions. Uh, and it really is just learning the words. I've given other examples, pension funds, investment trusts. Investment trusts, you know, it's just mutual funds. You know, you can invest in shares in companies directly. But instead of putting all your money in just one company, buy shares in a unit trust or a mutual fund. Lots of people are buying. They take the money. And they then have lots of money, which they invest in lots of companies. OK, over the page, <coughs> uh, there's a list there of financial markets. The capital markets, which essentially, we're talking about the stock exchange where shares are bought and sold. And money markets. Um, which is more related to uh, borrowing money. Now, this very um, short-term borrowing. Now, I'm not going to go through that list. Have a quick read. It's not tested in detail. Uh, and what is relevant is a, 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 our lecture in full uh, in the later lectures. But the one bit I do want to say a bit about now is, as regards to the main capital markets, uh, how the stock exchange works.
Now, you don't need great detail here, you don't. And what detail is needed is, again, covered in later chapters. But it is important that you know basically how the stock exchange, where shares are traded, how it works. Because a lot of people get a bit of the wrong idea. Companies may, may raise money by issuing shares. I may form a company today, issue shares, and everybody watching buys a few shares, you buy 100 shares, you buy 500, and so on. It's a way a company can raise money. But once the company's raised the money, you know, we invest in new projects and things, in a sense, that's the end of it for the company. But a quoted company, the shares you've bought when you gave me the money, you can sell to other people via the stock exchange. The stock exchange is nothing more than a market. You've got 100 shares. You decide you don't want them anymore. You can sell them to somebody else. Of course, it's hard, you're not going to walk around the streets asking people, do you want to buy my shares? Well, the stock exchange, you've got dealers sitting in the stock exchange who are buying shares and selling shares. They're intermediaries again. And why do share prices change? You know, you may have a share on the stock exchange that today has a market value of $5. Ooh, tomorrow the price might be $6. Why? Well, we'll talk a lot about the theory later. Again, there's a whole chapter on why share prices are what they are. But and people say, oh, it's supply and demand. If people want them, the price goes up. If people don't want them, the price goes up. True. But the person who fixes the price is the dealer. You have a dealer sat there whose job is to buy shares from people who want to sell and sell them to people who want to buy. And they need to make sure they can match the two. If at the moment the price is $5 and you've got lots of people who want to buy but nobody wants to sell, how do we encourage people to sell? The dealer only makes money by having people buying and selling. So if lots of people want to buy and nobody's selling, the dealer ups the price. Ooh, put the price up to $6. Ooh, hopefully that means more people will start selling. If not enough are selling, he'll put the price up still more. The dealer puts the price up and down to try and make sure that you've got as many people wanting to sell as you have wanting to buy. So it is supply and demand, but appreciate how it actually works. It is just like a market. Uh, that's why it's called the stock market. So, you know, if, you, if you've got a store in an ordinary market selling flowers, if nobody's buying the flowers, you need to get rid of them. You put the price down until people start buying. On the other hand, if there's a huge number of people queuing up to buy and you haven't got enough, you put the price up. So it is supply and demand, but it's the dealer who actually marks the price up and down in response to the supply and demand. Now, why people are prepared to pay $6 or sell at $6, that's where there's a lot of theory. Uh, 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 and that, again, is a later chapter. I can't go through the whole syllabus uh, just in one lecture. So I have a read of what I've written there, which is saying the same sort of thing. Uh, and also, bulls and bears. Uh, a lot of people, you know, trade in shares just to try and make a profit. Oh, the price is $5. I think it's going to go to $6. I'll buy some. Then I can sell them next week and make a profit. Uh, well, people who think prices are going to go up, we call them bulls. We say there's a bull market when the price is increasing. Um, if people think the price is going to go down, we call them a bear. We say there's a bear market. 
if prices are falling. Uh, over the page, there's two more things that are important. The, the next one, um, what we call financial market efficiency. Uh, it said when I referred to share prices, you know, if the price goes to $6, why are people prepared to pay $6? Well, although we're going to go through all the theory later, it all depends how well they think the company's going to be doing. It's how, you know, if you think a company's going to do really well in the future, you'll pay a high price for the share. If you think it's going to do badly in the future, you'll pay a low price. It's what you expect in the future that matters. You know, my company may have been making losses for the last 50 years. But if you think I'm going to start making big profits in the future, you'll be prepared to pay a lot for the shares. Equally, my company may, may have been making huge profits in the past. But if you think I'm going to be losing money in the future, you won't pay much for the shares. So you'll see when we come to the theory in later chapters, the price you'll pay depends very much on what you expect in the future. But what you expect depends on how much information you know about the company. You know, how do you find out information about the company? All right, you get a set of accounts. Let's just tell you about last year. Um, maybe you know somebody, one of the directors, and you know what they're going to do. That's illegal. It's called insider trading. But the point is, there's a limit to how much information you know about the company. The more you know about the company's future plans, the more you can have what you might call a fair price for the shares. Oh, I think this company is going to do really well. I'll pay six dollars. But how do I know it's going to do really well? You know, the more I know about the company's plans, the more certain I'll be as to whether it's going to do well or badly. Well, this is called the efficient market hypothesis. And again, this is tested in the exam. No numbers, no numbers at all here. But we say how efficient the market is, how realistic or how fair share prices are, depends on how much information is available to investors. Now, if the market starting at the end is strong form, what we call strong form efficient, uh, then it's saying that shareholders have all information relevant to the company, both published and unpublished. That they know everything that the company is planning to do. And therefore, they can have a perfect share price. They know exactly what the company is going to be worth. And we call that strong form efficient. Now, the other extreme, weak form efficient, is when they've no information about the company. All they can look at is what the share price has been in the past. But they've no information as to what, how well or badly the company's going to do in the future. In the middle, we call semi-strong, where share prices, they're fixed by shareholders ultimately, but the investors, they reflect all information currently publicly available. And that is, you know, we regard stock markets at the moment as being semi-strong. You know, uh, companies have to publish more and more information about what they're doing. But uh, investors don't have all the information about future plans, you know, what goes on in board meetings, you know, they do get more and more information, much more information than they used to. The markets in that sense are getting more efficient, uh, but they don't have all information. Uh, finally, or almost finally, sorry, 
over the page uh, a bit about interest rates. Yet again, no um, arithmetic, but with a lot of arithmetic later dealing with interest rates, and this is again background to it. If you borrow money, or if you deposit money, you have to pay interest or you receive interest. And the two things to this, first of all, 7.1, the factors which determine interest rates, and I think all these are pretty sensible, the general level of rates in the economy, you know, because of other factors within the com uh, economy, general interest rates go up, go down. And that will affect the interest rates that you have to pay if you borrow money. Uh, in addition, the level of risk. If you're depositing money, how safe is the deposit? The more, the less safe it is, the more risky it is, the higher interest you'll want. If you're borrowing money, the rate the bank charges you will depend on how risky they think you are. If they think you're very risky, you might end up not repaying, they'll want a, a very high interest rate. The duration, the length of the loan. The longer you borrow money for or deposit money for, well, the different the interest rate's going to be. And generally speaking, think about depositing. Generally, the longer you deposit money for, if I deposit money for a fixed 10 years as opposed to just one year, generally you'd expect a higher interest rate. The longer you prepare to deposit for. And similarly, when you borrow money, the length of the loan you're taking will affect the rate of interest to charge. Uh, and finally, the size. The interest rate you'd be given when you deposit is likely to depend how much you're depositing. Again, it's not a rule, but usually the more you're prepared to deposit, the more interest will pay. And equally, if you're borrowing, the more you're borrowing, or potentially the more interest you'll pay. Over the page, related to this, is something called the yield curve. And what the yield curve is showing is how the interest rate will vary with the length of the deposit or the borrowing. You know, whether you're borrowing just for one year, or whether you're borrowing for five years, or whether you're borrowing for ten years. Well, as I said a few minutes ago, although it's not a rule, generally speaking, the longer the period you're borrowing for, you know, fixed term borrowing, I want a one year loan, I want a ten year loan, generally speaking, you would normally expect the rate of interest they're charging to be higher the longer the period. That's simply depositing. If you deposit money for 10 years, generally you'd expect a higher interest rate than if you were only depositing for one year. Now we call that the yield curve. And the shape of it whether it goes up or down, generally speaking, it does go like this. It depends on three things. And again, these three have been mentioned, so be aware what they are. First of all, expectations theory. If you're depositing money for 10 years at fixed interest, and they say, oh, we'll give you 10% interest a year, it, it's then 10% interest every year, regardless what happens to general interest rates in the economy. You know, once you've made your deposit, if it's a fixed interest, you're guaranteed that interest. And similarly, if you've borrowed a fixed interest. And so the rates of interest the bank quote will very much depend on what they think is going to happen to interest rates in the future. You know, if they think interest rates are going to go up a lot, then the longer you're borrowing for, 
they're going to lend you at fixed interest. They'll the higher the interest they'll charge. Well, that's expectations theory. Uh, the second reason, liquidity preference theory, which sounds very fascinating. Think about uh, you depositing. If you're depositing for fixed periods, for one year, for five years, for ten years, the longer you're depositing for, the longer you're doing without the cash and you want compensating for it. If it's fixed term deposits, if you've deposited for 10 years, well, you can't get it back for 10 years. And so, standardly, if the longer you deposit it for, the more compensation, the more interest rate you want. And similarly reverse when the bank's lending money. Uh, finally, segmentation theory. Ooh. What this is and what explains the fact that in the little um, drawing in the notes is that jump or hiccup, whatever, it's a nice little curve, is that in fact different types of people tend to borrow and deposit for different lengths of time. What I mean, I'm not suggesting this is a rule, but just suppose maybe most individuals only deposit and borrow for, let's say, a maximum of five years. Just suppose. On the other hand, maybe companies, ooh, maybe they tend to borrow and deposit for periods of more than five years. Again, I'm not saying that's a rule, but the point is, different types of borrowers and depositors have different attitudes. So if I say that, oh, uh, individuals who only tend to borrow deposit for up to five years, well, that's the way they react, depending on expectations and liquidity preference. Maybe it's only companies who borrow for more than five years, and they react differently to expectations and liquidity preference. So that's why the shape of the curve can change rather than be a nice, smooth curve. All right, finally, something completely separate from the earlier bits, but very easy, and something recently he tends to ask in just about every exam, only as a two-mark question. But even so, once you've got it, it's an easy two marks. Something called the total shareholder return over a year. Now later, again, yet again, in later chapters, we've got a lot of different returns to shareholders. But the total shareholder return over a year is just <laughs> what percentage benefit as a share as a share on the hand. Let me show you what I mean with an example. Uh, the share price of XYZ at the 1st of January 2015 was $4.80 per share. During the year, a dividend of 20 cents was paid, and the share price at the end of the year had gone up to $5.10. So how much is the shareholder? benefited over the year. They've had a dividend of 20 cents. But in addition, they benefited from the fact that the share price increased. It went up uh, from what? 480 to 510. It's gone up by 30 cents. And so in the total benefit to the shareholders over the year has been 50 cents. 20 cents in cash, 30 cents by an increase in the share price. Well, we express that to get the return as a percent of what the share price was at the start of the year. At the start of the year, the share price was $4.80. Over the year, they earned in total 50 cents. 
and so in percentage terms. We say they've had a return of 10.42%. And generally speaking, in the exam, do this sort of thing to two decimal places. But there we are. Just to make sure, look at the second example. Example two. The share price for this company on 1st of January was $6.50. During the year, a dividend, again, of 50 cents was paid. But the share price at the end of the year was $6.40. So what's the return? Well, over the year, they've had a dividend of 50 cents. The share price, ah, well, here over the year, it fell uh, 6 50 down to 6 40 so they've lost 10 cents on the value of the share. So we say overall, it's 40 cents. Combination of the dividend and the gain or loss on the share price. The return, we express that as a percentage of the share price at the start of the year. At the start of the year, it was 650. Uh, which is a return, total return of, I think this is right, 6.15% over the year. So an easy exercise. And I better just mention, because I'm sure some, some of you are, are wondering, could the return be negative? Well, it could. You know, without giving you a third example. If example two, if I told you the dividend had only been five cents, and the share price had gone down 10 cents, then the return overall, uh, gain of 5, loss of 10, overall it's minus 5 cents. And so the total return would end up being negative. On this measure, it can be negative. Uh, the exam, I think that's rather unlikely. In the exam, I think it's always been positive. Uh, but on this measure, it can be negative. Okay, so I've talked for quite a long time, sorry. Most of that, as I said, is background, but at the same time, each individual bit can be tested on. Uh, and I say again, when we've gone through all the detail, the theories relating to share prices, uh, the theories relating to long-term borrowing and so on. When you've done all the other chapters, I would have another quick read of this chapter and another quick listen to the lecture.